I'm Andrea Gage Michaels, host of Elder Law Attorney News, brought to you by Krauss Financial Services. Elder Law Attorney News is a special web series designed to connect lawyers with industry leaders in elder law, long-term care living, and more. Today I'm joined by attorney Steve Riley. Steve is a shareholder at Atticus, a law practice management consulting firm. Steve serves as a certified practice advisor and, as any lawyer who's chatted with him can attest, a bit of a clairvoyant. There's a reason he's so adept at divining the business and practice needs of attorneys. He practiced as a litigator and tried more than 100 cases, including jury trials. After a decade of litigation, he transitioned to estate planning and elder law, where his success led others to seek his mentorship. Now he's advising full-time and taking a few minutes of his time to share his knowledge with us. Steve, let's jump right in. You've said that the skills that you need today are not the ones that you need to develop for tomorrow. Can you tell me what you mean by that? Great question. So one of the things that uh, is a challenge as you go to grow your practice is that you think the solution is to work harder. And that's really not the solution. Uh, that the core of this is really thinking through if you're in a practice, let's say you're doing a half million dollars in gross revenue and your goal is to have a million dollar practice, then you have to start thinking about what are the skills that a million dollar producer has. So you have to really kind of start anticipating and readjusting skills because we know what it takes to build a million, half a million dollar practice. That's what you got. So if you're really trying to build another level of practice, really what you have to evaluate is first yourself. And you have to evaluate your leadership skills, your management skills, uh, some of your core business skills, which I can talk about in a minute. And that's really what you need to start to anticipate. So the mistake that we all make is that we try to work more. And it's really not. We have to work more strategically. We have to work differently. We have to look at the core habits, our core business skills, and say, okay, what does a million-dollar producer do that a half-a-million-dollar producer doesn't do? And that becomes more of an interesting question for me. So working harder, working longer, working more is a trap. And it's a trap they really, I think, honestly, in law school, they teach us. In law school, they really don't teach us to be great partners. They don't teach us to be rainmakers. They teach us to be great employees. They take us and train us to be great associate attorneys to plug and play a law firm because the law schools are really worried about their employment rates. Like how many, how many kids do they get placed? They're worried about that. They're not worried about whether or not you'll be a great practitioner five to 10 years out. They just want you to get a job. And that's all they train you for. That's all they get you ready for. And consequently, you got a mindset of um, one way of thinking about growth. You don't have an entrepreneurial mindset. You don't have a growth mindset. You just kind of have an employee mindset. And so you think the solution then is to work harder, more, faster. That's not. It's to work differently. It's to take a completely different approach to practice. So it's a great question. To work differently, to go from working harder to working smarter, what are the four top skills that an attorney needs to hone? This is something, uh, is another good question, something that I've always wrestled with. So the first thing, let's go to our half a million dollar to million dollar producer, or it could be a million to two million dollar producer. Um, the first thing that you want to think about is your time management and focus skills. So number one is time management and focus. So if you're following along and want to take notes, write number one, time management and focus. Because to actually implement and change some of the behaviors, you're going to have to free time in your calendar. So I like to use an example of a jelly bean jar. If, you're, if your day looks like a jam-packed jelly bean jar where jelly beans are overflowing, you've got no time to make a change. You have no time to change your marketing, staffing nothing you get no time so to actually implement change to grow from a half million dollar practice to a million dollar practice the first thing you need to do is change how you focus your time and how you manage your time so we open up time in that calendar so we can implement growth projects change projects so the first thing is time management the second thing is client development how to bring great cases in the door knowing the difference between a good case a great case bad case, awful case, and being able to start to distinguish that you want to upgrade over time. You want to upgrade the profitability, the quality of the case, the quality of the client, the quality of the referral source. So really looking at how do you get great cases in the door constantly. And as you go from a half million to a million or a million to two million, you're always going to be upgrading those cases. So client development skills. 
Three is staffing, really building a great team. And most lawyers go through a couple of different stages. They usually just hire a dependable human being who can kind of show up on time. And they realize they need to upgrade to somebody more and upgrade to somebody more to upgrade somebody more. And it's fun to watch lawyers go through their careers, learning how to recruit, train, motivate, lead, manage, um, reward, and cultivate a great team. So you go from a period of time where you're just trying to get someone to help you get work done. And you're really thinking about, man, what do I have to do to, to build a great culture where lo people love to work here? and I retain my best people, I get rid of my underperformers, and that becomes a whole level of management and business skill. And then last but not least is cash flow and profitability. Like how do you price your services? How do you price them so that they're profitable? How do you price them so that you know you're competitive in the marketplace? How do you price them? Do you do hourly? Do you fix? What do you do? And so those four skills, uh, we consider those the four cornerstones at Atticus, the four cornerstones business skills. So time management, client development, uh, staffing, basically building a great team, and cash flow and profitability. Those are the four things for me. If you're looking to grow, those are the four skills. And as you grow, when you go from 100000 to half a million dollars in production, those four skills look different. Half a million to a million, those four skills look different. Million, two million, those four skills look different. Two million to 10 million, those four skills look different. So each evolution of growth, those skills change. Now, the skills are the same skills, but just different skills in those categories. So yeah, great question, Andrea. Very good. Uh, I'd like to tackle one of the things that's probably the toughest for a lot of attorneys, especially as they're contemplating going from thousandaires to millionaires. Uh, you know, there might be some lawyers out there who can't even comprehend uh, making it into that millionaire bracket. And, and one of the toughest things for them is managing people and grooming their staff. Uh, tell us a little bit more about how to properly groom a staff uh, when you're starting to make that climb? Oh, wow. There's a lot there. So um, I'm going to share with you two stories. So the first story is an experience that's well known in the Atticus world as the Marge story. And I called a law firm in Texas and the woman that answered the phone answered the phone like this, a law office. And I swear to God, I can see the cigarette hanging out of the mouth. <clears throat> and I called her and I said, um, well, you know, I'm calling because the owner of the firm, his name uh, is Richard. <laughs> if you ever watch this, Richard, you can call me. Uh, Richard said, you know, Richard asked me to call and talk to him about his marketing. And she goes, ah, all right. And so she puts me through. I talked to Richard and I asked Richard a series of questions. Like, so talk to me about your case management, talk to me about your marketing, talk to me about this, talk to me about that. And I said, what do you think the breakdown is? He goes, well, we're doing everything right. We're doing all our marketing. Everything's work great. But we're having a difficult time taking our leads and converting them to meetings. And I'm like, ah, I think I might be onto the problem, Richard. I, I'm, I'm not sure. But does the young lady who answers the phone, <laughs> does she always answer the phone? Oh, yeah, she does. And I said, that's Marge, right? Yeah. How long has Marge been here? And he's like, well, Marge has been here for 27 years. And I'm like, I see. And I said, I think Marge needs to go. I think the first thing what you do is take Marge, take her out back and shoot her. Because you can't, if you're trying to convert leads, that's the worst way you can answer the phone. Long story short, he didn't want to do it, especially he's been there so long. Like she started with the firm and Abe Lincoln found the firm kind of relationship, right? So um, it took about six months, maybe nine months, and we finally got rid of March. But Richard made the first big mistake that a lot of lawyers make when growing their practice. They adopt, they don't manage. And what I mean by that is that you don't know what you're doing from a management perspective. You don't have the skills. So you try and manage people through a friendship template or a social template. And you got to get they're not your friends. You're paying the money to do a job. And if they don't respond to your direction from a management perspective, that doesn't mean that you have to be dictatorial. It doesn't mean that you say this is the only one way to do it. But if you say, I want information entered into the case management system, and Marge goes, yeah, I don't do that. 
And you say, well, Marge, you got to do that for the job. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Then Marge needs to go. And I don't care how long Marge worked there. If Marge says, yeah, I don't put messages into the, you know, I've been keep writing message into these pink notebooks for my entire career. I'm not going to put them in the case management system. Marge needs to go. If, manage, if Marge is not going to track your prospects and leads, Marge needs to go. So the first thing is, the first story is, you know, you really want to get clear, are you hiring? Are you adopting your team? And if you can't correct them, if you can't redirect them, if you can't make them do what you want them to do from a management perspective, and you're afraid to tell them, look, you've been 30 minutes late three times this week, what's going on? Something I need to know about. Um, if you can't have that conversation, then you've adopted the person. And if you can't manage them and you're trying to manage them through adoption, you're never going to grow the firm beyond that one core relationship, the adopted relationship. You're stuck. You're totally stuck. And you think the key secret is that they're going to do stuff for you because you're a nice person. Not going to work. They're going to do work for you because they respect you as a manager and a leader, not because you're a nice person. You may be a great manager, a great leader, and a nice person. So the first story is really... Do you hire or do you adopt as a lawyer? Second story, and this is a cruel one, okay? Most lawyers practice because they really want to make a difference. And they're, I like to say we're do-gooders with the anti-authoritarian streak. We want to do a good job. We want to do right by people, but by God, don't tell us how to do it. And consequently, we manage our firms from a heroic perspective. We have a heroic mind template, a heroic management template. So we think of the world from a heroic perspective. We're there to save the day. And consequently, if you look in your law firm and you're the hero inside your law firm and you're being emotionally validated by certain things that you do inside the law firm and you do those things to be emotionally validated, to feel good about your life, to feel good about who you are, um, your law firm will be stuck at nowhere, I would guess somewhere between three to four to six employees because only you as the superhero can do certain things. And I'm going to invite you to look at it because the real trap then is the heroic mindset. The clients are coming there because they're the hero of their story, not because you're the hero of their story. So the shift has to be for you as a business owner, how do you help them on their heroic journey? How do you help them solve whatever that problem is? And if you're doing it because you're the hero of the journey, not the client, then you're always going to be stuck. And the staff will know that. They'll know, well, it's 4.30 on Friday and I wanna go see my kid's soccer game. Hmm, how do I get out of this client problem? Oh, wow, Steve, Mrs. Smith calls. She only wants to talk to you. Oh, only you can respond to this email, only you. And they know at that moment, they're taking your cape and hanging you with it. They know you like to be the hero of the story. So when you look at it, the two biggest things is do you hire or do you adopt? And are you the hero inside the law firm? Are you the hero? If you're the hero inside the law firm, you're, you're doomed. You're going to probably never get beyond six people at the most because only you can do it. You want to start to think, how do I shift my entire perspective, my entire thinking to helping my client through a heroic journey? So you've asked two really, I mean, you asked a really big question. Those are the two common things I see over and over and over that crush lawyers constantly. So those are the two stories. Do you think there's a root cause to that? Are lawyers, uh, when they're starting out trying to manage, are they confusing being friends with their employees with creating a friendly environment? I mean, what you're describing sounds like they're recreating a, a family dynamic in the office that really is, is better suited for home if even there. Yeah, you, you totally nailed it. They don't know what they're doing. They have no business skills. So they just go back to the only thing they know, which is a family dynamic or a friendship dynamic or a friendship template. They've never been trained as a manager. They probably have never been managed very well by another lawyer or another law firm. So they have no management understanding or skills whatsoever. It like doesn't even occur to them. So they go to a friendship template. They like to be really nice to people and really kind to people and try and create a really warm, friendly environment. So people like that. And, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, if you can't manage and direct people, 
then it gets to be more of a social club and it's out of control. And in, in this case, Marge ruled the roost. Any high performer will leave when they see the low performers are rewarded. And so if you are captive by a low performer because you've adopted them, if you can't retrain them, rehabilitate them, they need to go. And if you can't get them out of there, then you're stuck. Mm -hmm. The story in this case, that firm has grown, their revenues have grown, I think about seven times since they got rid of that person. They were stuck for about 15 years at one revenue level. And when they got rid of that person, they start really looking at how they're recruiting people, hiring people, training people. They're now grown the revenue seven times in my recollection. It's been about a year or two since I've talked to them about seven times as a growth. They doubled in the first year. They tripled, I think, within three or four years after that termination of that employee because it, it, she was impeding everything. So you're right on the money. You don't know what to do. So this is one of the reasons Atticus and what we do is so important for me from a passion perspective. We take really great lawyers and teach them how to be really great managers, leaders of law firms. We really teach them how to, how to take those business skills and go to the next level. And it allows them to actually make a greater difference for their teams, greater difference for their staff, greater difference for everybody because you just learn those skills. You're great at the law, but you need those business skills to really run a great practice. So it's a great question. I think, I think that's, they don't know any better. There's, you know, they're smart people. They think all they need is their intellectual capabilities. And they're good. And that's a whole skill set, completely different skill set, like parenting. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're a parent, you'll totally get this. You know, I always joke with my wife, we just need to be 90 days ahead of the kids. We don't have to be 10 years, just 90 days ahead. Stay ahead skill set wise, 90 days ahead. Otherwise, we're in trouble. So as a lawyer, you just need about 90 days ahead of your team. Skill wise, just 90 days ahead, not years, just 90 days. It's not too big. Great question, though. Well, let's say a firm has been dealing with their own Marge. They've given her a performance improvement plan. Uh, they've taken the steps and Marge is just not catching on. Um, and they realize it's time to let Marge go. I, I think a lot of managers, uh, especially new ones or ones that are starting to make that transition from being a friend to really having a, a friendly environment, uh, how would you advise them on, on having that conversation and letting somebody go? Uh, I would think that would cause a lot of heartburn for a lot of attorneys to, to terminate somebody. Yeah, you know, it's a great question because you invested money and time and quite frankly, a lot of emotions into the relationship. Uh, there's a fantastic book by multiple authors out there called Crucial Conversations. And one of the books that we recommend a lot to our clients and it's required for reading one of the programs is a book by Dr. Henry Cloud called Necessary Endings. So one of the things we do is we try and train um, our lawyers in how to have crucial conversations, how to hold people accountable. And so you want to look at, have you explained to this person, um, you know, what you're committed to in the relationship? Have you kind of explained to them the performance criteria? And most of this is really for you to feel good that you gave them the best chance to rehabilitate. So if you feel like you've done that, you've captured it in writing, then you have to have performance deadlines. And if they haven't changed their performances by the deadline from a straight up integrity perspective, accountability perspective, you have to have consequences. And if one of those consequences is I'm going to have to terminate you in our relationship as an employee, we can be friends, but you can't perform here anymore because you're not performing against my standards. It's one of the toughest things that you have to do as a manager. But here's the thing. If you don't learn how to do that, your firm's level of performance will never rise above that person's level of performance because any high performer will see a low performer being treated really well and they'll realize any extra effort, any, anything doesn't have to be above that person's standard. And they realize that it's not a, a firm that rewards high performance, it's a firm that rewards politics. And a firm that rewards politics never grows beyond a certain level because everybody knows just to suck up to the boss, be nice to the boss, keep the political structure going and everything's cool. So your firm will never perform at a standard that you want. It will work like a little political club. And so you have, if you're cool with that, it totally works. But if you're like, no, actually, I really want a firm that has a high performance standard because a high performing firm 
can actually make a bigger impact on the clients. And this is, goes back to the hero of the story. If you're really in the game to make a huge difference for your clients, to your referral sources, to your community, then you're going to have to shift. My thinking has to be the high performance. So with all that being said, Andrew, all that being said, you're going to have to um, have a high level of integrity towards the vision of what your firm wants to be and hold yourself to the same standard and have a crucial conversation with that person and say, if your performance doesn't get up to this level, you have to go. And I've had, you know, we all have, we've all had to learn it. We've all had to have walk in those meetings and have difficult conversations. Now, some lawyers like to have team member, uh, team leaders do that. I, I don't think it's fair to the team leaders. I think first and foremost, you as the lawyer have to be the bad cop. Your team leader needs to be the good cop. Most lawyers, because we're wimps, always joke, we're lions in the courtroom, lambs in the office. And I said, if, you're, if you are afraid of doing that, you've got to really learn how to have that skill. And it's really, once again, a skill development. How do you have that managerial leadership conversation with somebody? Those are the two best books I can think of if you're not in an Atticus program or you can't afford an Atticus program. Henry Cloud's Necessary Endings is fantastic and Crucial Conversations is a fantastic book. Those are two great places to start. But at the end of the day, you've got to have the integrity and respect your own what you're trying to build a law firm and you've got to hold that person accountable. If you don't, you're, you're, you're stuck. And sometimes you've got to go in there and just say, look, I'm not even beginning to have a conversation with you. You're just fired. Um, you're just out of here. And sometimes the public execution is really good for team morale uh, because they know you can do it. You'll do it you know, effectively, efficiently, professionally, and just fire somebody on the spot. Sometimes they like to see you cultivate, you know, a little bit of empathy and over time give a person the ability to rehabilitate themselves so they can't, they need to go. But your team is going to respect you for it. Everybody will respect you for it. And what usually happens is that I can't think of a single person that I've fired that I've gone back and said, wow, I really regret firing them. However, I can think of about five people I fired that over time came back to me and thanked me for firing them. And um, one, two, three of the five I rehired because they came back learning the lesson. Like what, it, what the problem was when they worked for me, um, I couldn't fix, I terminated them. They went to work somewhere else. And then they realized that problem was still there. They solved the issue and then they came back. So it could be, uh, one attorney I let go because she couldn't keep her office clean and organized, drove me crazy. So we let her go. And then she went to a firm where it looked like, you know, I walked into the firm one day, I knew the owner. And I, I really expected, Andrea, I expected you to see evidence tape on the floor. I really expected, it looked like a crime scene. I really expected to see evidence tape on the floor, like in, in the lawyers. It was unbelievable. I had stressed me out to walk through the office. There were banker boxes leaning all over the place. It was just scary. It looked like a cave of banker boxes. Was, I don't know how they got clients. I have no idea how they got clients. Oh, I do. They had one clean conference room. The rest of the place <laughs> looked like a bad scene from the TV show Orders. So for me, I like to keep the lawyer's offices showroom ready because it told me that the lawyer's head was showroom ready. A messy office is usually a sign of an out of control practice. If you're using your office and your desk like a to-do list, your practice is out of control. If you're using your inbox like a to-do list, it's out of control. That means you haven't in, in your head thought it through, how does this work? Never confuse a messy desk with a sign of success. It's usually a sign of poor cash flow because if you've got a clean desk, you can manage your cash flow. A messy desk usually means a lawyer's trying to manage their cash flow by their desk. They're like, okay, I got these cases here that I'll cover next week. These cases here I'll cover this week. These cases here, I don't know what to do with the guy to clean up. And so that's usually what you see. Uh, a messy desk is usually a sign of a poor cash flow management firm. They're trying to manage it by case management, not actual cash flow management. So I don't mean to go so deep on that. You asked a really good question. I have it too Actually, far too far too far. I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> a, it's a great point, though. I have managed quarters in the past and it is very difficult uh, to get them to 
understand the importance of a tidy office. You know, as a consumer, when you walk into somebody's office, even if they're uh, quickly escorting you to the conference room, if you catch a glance of someone looking truly unprofessional, it really does affect your perception of their abilities. I think. Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. And just the, you know, the, uh, um, the extermination costs alone, you have no idea what's lurking under, the, under those piles. It's too stressful, it's too stressful. But you raise a good point. So here, here's the thing is if you're looking at this, if you're listening to this video and thinking about this, none of your clients, prospects or referral sources can judge whether you're any good. They can't cut your head open and say, my God, Andrea's a brilliant lawyer. <laughs> but they can judge how they're treated. And they will make all kinds of assumptions based on how you look, which is really unfair. Um, you know, if you look at Andrea, look at me, it's just not fair. You know, it's not fair. She's got a huge advantage there. Two, um, how the staff treats you. Are you on time? How does your office smell? How does your office appear? Does it look like a first class experience? Does it look like what you want a lawyer to look like? So all these different things play into the judgment of whether or not they've hired the right person. So it's more of an emotional, psychological play for the prospects and referral sources than a pure academic play. And that's where most lawyers blow it. They're like, they're caught in the belief that if you're a really smart lawyer, you'll get business. No, you won't. You won't. If you treat customers and referral sources like they're gold, you make it a great experience, you'll get a ton of business. You can hire the really smart lawyers who can't figure out how to treat people great um, to work for you and you'll run a good process. That was why I had, that's my hoarder. My hoarder was a brilliant lawyer, lawyer, still is a brilliant lawyer. And she went to work for another firm and realized that firm was chaos. And then she called me about a year later and say, I, I totally get why you fired me. And if you ever could see in your heart to consider hiring me back, would you? And I'm like, yeah, you're a gifted lawyer. You just have to follow the process. And when she came back, she followed the process and was a fan, still is a fantastic relationship to this day. So we all learn from it. You just have to have the guts to make the judgment call sometimes. This is, this is not a good fit. And sometimes it's not a good fit for just values reasons. You're like, oh, no, it's not a good fit for values. It's onboarding for values is very hard to do. But it's probably when you realize that, um, it's probably the most crucial thing that you can do. Um, it takes a lot to learn. learn. Learn what your firm values are, learn what your personal values are. And uh, in your first interview, put those non-negotiables up front. I think these are non-negotiable for me. And if you can't live with these non-negotiables in our value system, um, then don't come in. You know, don't, This is not a good fit for you. And sometimes you're able to communicate specifically what integrity looks like. So integrity looks like being on time for work. Integrity looks like if you told a client you'll do something by four o'clock, you'll do it by four o'clock. Integrity looks like, you know, if you promise something to a referral source, you do it. And so it doesn't look like just a generic word. It looks like behavior. So describing what the behaviors look like, having a really bad conversation that you don't want to have with a client, um, is integrity, you know, procrastinating, trying to avoid that really critically awkward, difficult conversation is integrity. So, you know, can you do that? That's one of the most critical elements of working in our firm. You have to be able to deliver bad news with empathy and passion, but you have to deliver bad news when the shitty, sorry, one of the bad things about this job is you have to deliver some bad news to somebody sometimes. Sometimes if you're staff, you did a bad job or you blew it. I really like... I really like how you describe integrity because a lot of people will think that's just this amorphous concept. Um, but when I heard you speaking about it, it seemed very tangible. And time, timeliness, punctuality, managing your time really seems to figure into um, you know creating a sense of integrity. Uh, what is one of the number one mistakes that lawyers are making when they're managing themselves and managing their time? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I think this is the number one mistake. Uh, and I'll, I'll, this sounds really weird. Not taking time off. <clears throat> because the biggest problem that we have, really what people pay us for is not the documents, not the package of instruments we prepare. But they really pay us for solving complex problems. So you have to have great judgment to solve complex problems. Now you may say this 
solve the same complex problem over and over and over so that you can do it in your sleep. But if you actually want to grow for your brain to recover and for your judgment to improve, you actually have to take time away from work. And so time away from work means no email, no phone calls, no work. And so having a two to three day recovery period where you actually rest, rejuvenate, recover, um, allows your brain to actually improve over time, the neuroplasticity. So there's a lot of studies, a lot of work out there that will actually show that your brain improves. But if you keep doing the same thing over and over for your brain, it will not improve. Actually, your, your cognitive function will decline. So it's kind of like an athlete. If, as an athlete, if you go in and you do push-ups every single day and you never give your, chan chan your body a chance to recover, you won't get stronger, you'll just decline over time. So I think the biggest mistake is actually not taking time off. And we were taught as young lawyers that the secret to success is extensive hours in the office learning the craft, which I think is um, important probably for one or two years, like learning the business. But I would think somewhere between five to 10 years, you've learned the craft, you've learned the business. Now what people are paying for your, is your ability to strategically think at a different level, to think, at, to solve complex problems at a different level, to use your judgment at a different level. To do that, you have to take time off to recover and rejuvenate. And um, that's probably the biggest challenge I think the top performers have to take time off. I think the second biggest mistake that um, if you're not at that point, like you know, you're the first five to 10 years of your career in building a practice is learning um, not to take bad cases, like learning what a bad case looks like, because nothing can screw up your time, your stress, and your ability to sleep at night than taking a really bad case. So saying no to bad cases and pricing them accordingly is probably the second biggest time management mistake. Um, and then, you know, appreciating that your phone is not an electronic leash. You know, you can turn your phone off. You can log out of your email accounts. You don't have to be on 24 hours a day. That's really an expectation setting issue with clients and prospects more than anything else. The top three, how's that? You asked when I gave you three, sorry. Uh, well, the more the merrier, because I think, um, you know, all of this would resonate uh, with lawyers who are watching. I think lawyers too also do feel that level of guilt for, you know, taking any time away from casework, whether it's taking time off or working on things like marketing. How should lawyers balance that, especially if they're charged with doing the casework and, and making it rain, bringing those clients in? How do you, how do you juggle that? What, how would you proportion that in an ideal situation? But it's a great question. It depends on the solo practitioner. If you're a solo, where are you at in the growth of your practice? If you have no work and you're trying to grow a practice, for me, it's an 80-20 rule. So I like 80% of your time marketing and 20% of the time doing the work. If you have more work than, you know, you're, you're good work, you're paying the bills, cash flow is good, that's probably a 50-50. If you have more work than you know what to do with, then it's probably 80% production, 20% marketing. But one of our rules of thumb, my partner said this all the time, Mark Powers, never, never, never stop marketing. So I really think one of the most important things as an owner is that you keep marketing. And if you have more work than you know what to do with, minimally 10% of your time needs to be marketing because you want to be constantly upgrading your referral sources, constantly upgrading your cases, constantly upgrading your relationships. You can't do that at the desk. And so what you see is with a lot of lawyers, they work, they market and they get a whole bunch of work in and then they do the work and then they realize they're running out of work, then they market. And that's why you see lawyers have the ebb and flow with their cash flow kind of goes like this because they market, bring in work, do the work, uh, run out of work, market, do the work, run out of work, do the work. So you have to get some consistency there and you have some consistency there. And so it's one of your responsibilities as the lawyer to really, you know, most lawyers are the primary rainmaker for a firm. It's your probably biggest responsibility as a lawyer is to making sure your team's fed. And to make sure your team's fed, you've got to develop a, a really, I like to call it a referral portfolio. You have, you got to develop referral relationships you got to figure out if you're going to advertise online, what that advertising looks like. But your job as the owner of the business is to bring in great cases so your team has great work to do. So that's one of the things I look at. Do you find that some attorneys, um, you know, once they master, you know, balancing the casework and bringing the clients in, do they have a blind spot when it comes to intakes? 
Um, are they are they putting enough time and effort into um, those interviews with with potential clients? Or are they just kind of winging it, thinking, all right, let's come in, we'll have an unstructured conversation about your issue, and then I'll jump right in. It, uh, should they have more of a process, and what should that process look like? It's a great question. There's two things there. So number one um, is I believe that your initial interview needs to be a structured experience. I believe that you should have an agenda. I think you should have price lists. I think you should be very clear what your written process is, and I think the written process should be communicated to your prospects. And the experience that I've had with most lawyers is I like to call it a hostage negotiation, Andrea. They just kind of do the two hour show up and throw up the yellow pad or white pad and just take notes and just talk. And I think that charm and their, the fact that the client gets to hang out with them is sufficient. Um, so I really think it's a sign that you haven't thought through your process and you haven't organized your process. But the first part of the question, you mentioned blind spot. So if I think if there's a blind spot, if you think about the initial consultation, let's imagine the initial consultation right here, um, two thirds of the work needs to occur prior to the initial consultation, meaning you're out there developing prospects and leads and you're setting expectations, you're setting pricing, you're setting all your referral sources. One third is actually doing the work. And for me, in a lot of law firms, we, we have it backwards. We think 95% of it's doing the work. If you're really are trying to get great cases and get good conversions and big profits, you want to understand that two thirds of the work needs to be done getting those high caliber prospects in the door to meet with you. Um, and if you're, if you're thinking 95% it's pushing buttons on the compu computers and delivering the documents, you're really having a very kind of, I like to call it kind of a, a desk viewpoint, not a complete client viewpoint, like a prospect viewpoint of what the customer journey is through your firm. So it's a really, it's a really interesting thing because the blind spot is sitting at the desk. You want to really say, okay, from the point in time the person had a need, I need to talk to the lawyer about this, the point in time they talk to a friend or a referral source, to the time they do the Google search, to the time they hit your website, to the time that your team set up the appointment, to the time that your team sent videos, to the time that your team sent them research, to the time that you sent team pre-education, the initial interview, what the initial interview was like, and what was the delivery, was it a request for referrals, were there acknowledgements? What, what was that process like? So the blind spot, I think, is most of the time is not understanding the whole process that that customer goes through and literally being blind to the fact that the fact that they found you in some cases in itself a miracle um, and really saying, okay, what do we have to do to make this miracle reoccur on a regular basis? So. All right, I feel like I'm talking way too much. No, you're sharing knowledge and it's all very valuable. So I, I appreciate that. Um, digging in a little bit more into the experience, um, once somebody has retained you, um, what are your thoughts on billable hours versus fixed pricing or flat fees? What works best for the client? And what do you think works best for the practitioner? And this is a, a pretty hot topic um, and people feel very passionately for one versus the other. Crazy, I, 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 lawyers get very upset and very mad at me on this topic. And I don't understand what the, the angry nature of this question is because for me, it's not really how we charge, it's really what the customer wants. You know, and so for me, I really have to say, let's pivot back and say, okay, what does the customer want? Well, if you don't, if you, if you really start to think about it and kind of do vision in your head, the customer wants a low risk, positive outcome. Well, if you don't know how to deliver a low risk, positive outcome, when I say low risk means low financial risk. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, then the only thing you can do as a lawyer is bill out. Because if you don't know how your process works, you're kind of making up your process. And if you're making up your process, you're making up your price. And the only way you can cover your price then is to do hourly work. And, and if you're going to do hourly work, then only you can do the hourly work. And consequently, over time, your margins get squeezed because only you can do the work and only you can be the big producer. And so you end up with a staff of one or two or three people because it's all going to rotate around your billables. And even if you bring an associate, you'll have a tendency to give the associate the crappy work, not the good work, because you want to keep the good work so you look like a hero and the associate gets the crappy work that you don't know how to price. So when you look at it, the hourly work is 
really pretty much not statistically is 96 percent of how attorneys work and it really is from our perspective of our inability to manage process our inability to manage customer expectations so if you pivot and say okay how do i best take great care of the customer and you break apart your process and you price different steps of your process then you can actually delegate and really create incredible experiences at each step of the process so my bias is towards fixed pricing because it's better for the customer, in my experience, because it's known, guaranteed, so they have limited risk, they know what they're spending. Two, and make sure that you have to have your process down. So make sure that you under intellectually understand as a business owner what your process looks like and how you're going to deliver it. And they also know timelines. So for me, a price, a fixed price or are, are, are known our communicated price to a customer is a um, reducing the risk, almost gives them somewhat of a service guarantee, more or less, but gives them greater control of the situation. Um, the hourly rate really gives the lawyer greater control of the situation, and most of the time we're so we're so terrible about billing by the hour. It's just it's just a dumb it's a dumb model. There's so many works out there against the model, but it's the predominant model. So you're going to not see many lawyers change because they feel secure. They, you know, change freaks them out. So they feel very, very secure that way. Um, I don't think on an hourly rate either, most of us really understand where the hourly rates come from. And we think it's what the market will bear. And what we do is we look at what other lawyers charge. And we go, well, Andrea's brilliant. So she charges 300 an hour. Therefore, I'm not as brilliant as she is. I should charge 250. What kind of pricing model is that? That makes no sense whatsoever. It means nothing to the customer you charge. They don't even know you exist. So for me, I always love going to fixed prices. Plus fixed prices give you the ability to delegate work. So if I charge $5,000 for a case, I know what I'm working with. I know what pieces need to be done. And if I'm aiming for a 50% profit margin, I know I got to get all that work done for roughly $2,500. So that work's got to get done and out the door from about $2,500 worth of cost so I can make a 50% margin. So if I'm looking at that, it gives me the ability to create process change inside the firm and train people on how to get that work and get that work done. I'm a big, obviously a big fan of fixed pricing, but you know, you got to learn to walk or learn to crawl before you can walk and walk before you run. So if you don't know what you're doing, start off hourly, work your way into small price increments for fixed prices, maybe fixed packages of certain services, and then work your way up. I don't know many firms that can go from hourly to fixed prices in one week. It takes probably about six months to a year, a little bit of guidance, understanding what processes that you need to set up, what you're going to package into fixed prices. But for me, um, once you understand how the fixed model works, you'll never go back. You'll be like, no, this is, this is the best thing because it gives you the ability to delegate it gives you ability to measure metrics is a lot better than how many hours you bill, which mean, doesn't mean a lot, and how many hours you collect, which doesn't mean a lot. Um, but it really starts to, it really opens up a whole avenue of thinking that allows you to really, at the end of the day, take better care of the client. So great question, lots to talk about there, lots to talk. You mentioned um, being competitive in your, in your markets. How can a lawyer know if uh, their rates are competitive or on par with you know, their, their colleagues in the community? Because a lot of lawyers are not necessarily transparent about their pricing. So how is that something that you can accu accurately gauge? Or is that really important in your process? Is it more about determining your costs and what's more advantageous for your client? That's a good question, really good question. So for me, um, if you have a referral-based practice, I don't get too uptight about what other lawyers charge because a person's getting referred into you, they're more than likely not pricing your services. So if you start to think about where the different avenues or different silos or different sources of business, if you're getting referrals, I'd be pretty confident on the referrals that whatever your pricing is, what your pricing is, and you're going to be able to control it by whether the clients accept or reject the pricing. And so that's really kind of a pure market will bear conversation. If you're competing on the internet through advertising and people are hitting your website and they're calling different firms, um, then you want to do some mystery shopping. And you want to hire somebody or have somebody do mystery shopping so they can compare, like pretend they're a prospect and go through the other firms 
and get the pricing out. Um, I do, when I was practicing actively, I would compare um, and I would go to lunch with most of my competitors. I knew home, most of my competitors knew each other fairly well. Um, we would compare pricing. We talked about pricing. We talked about process. I was probably the only fixed price shop in town. So if we had somebody that came in and went an hourly and they were really stuck on the hourly, I referred them to an hourly firm versus most of the time taking it. I say, well, let me refer you to this guy or that guy or to this woman. They'll take good care of you. They'll, they'll, they'll be really good. And because we don't do hourly here. Um, so for me, sometimes it was just knowing and talking to my um, competitors. But I was also very confident. And it took me a while to get confident to realize that most of my competitors were making it up. They were making up their prices. They didn't know. They were kind of mood billing and mood pricing. They didn't know. And then actually going to lunch with them or having drinks with them or coffee with them, whatever the case was, and talking through some issues and getting them confident. Um, I, you know, we, we went from competitors to collaborators on some cases. And I realized in my market, there's some lawyers that were really brilliant at what I did, what, what I did. They were better at what I, what I did in certain things. And I would co-counsel them on certain cases. I wasn't afraid of that. Um, which goes back to marketing. You got to really be comfortable with your marketing. You really have a lot of work. So you're comfortable collaborating with other lawyers. If you come out from scarcity, you'll never collaborate. You'll just be trying to hold cases close to the best. Um, to me, I think, especially if you're a member of elder counsel or wealth counsel or with Kraus Financial, the, the depth of those networks alone, um, I wouldn't hesitate to pick up the phone and call like Aaron, who I've known at Kraus for years and say, hey, Aaron, I got this problem. Uh, I got a case that looks like this. Who do you know that's really good in the country with this particular issue? Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with Valerie Peterson and calling her Hannah Shaw or Ron uh, at Wealth Council and being able to call them or even you, Andrew, I would, wouldn't hesitate to call and say, Who's, who do you think is the best at this? And so I would usually, if I had a really interesting case that was, I jammed me up, I would co-counsel. And I found I could accelerate the case quickly if I found the person who knew the, hand, the answer to that versus me trying to figure out how to do that. So I was really aggressive co-counseling. Comes from the premise that I'm not particularly bright. So, so I always look for really smart lawyers to make friends with so I could co-counsel with them. So that was one of my strategies. Find really smart friends, hang out with them, have them help you in the cases. Life is good. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because it really does seem like it's um, the most successful lawyering is having that balance of humility and confidence. Uh, you know, knowing your your strong points, knowing your weak points, and and knowing who to surround yourself with. Yeah, I think that's perfect. That's one of the reasons I love some of the associations that Krauses associate with, um, because it opens up a lot of brilliant, open doors to a lot of brilliant people. And that's your job at the end of the day for me, at least for me, I can't say that to everybody that's listening, but for me, your job is to take care of that person that comes to your office or presents a problem. And it necessarily wasn't my job to solve that problem as much as it was to find someone who knew how to solve that problem. And so I always looked at myself, if I couldn't figure it out, I knew there's someone that could solve that. And I always made a joke, I tried for years to get an LLM and it took me four or five years. Her name was Lisa. She graduated the top of the class from the University of Miami um, with an LLM in estate planning. And Lisa was brilliant. And the fact that I tried to get a degree made no sense. What I need to do is get someone that had that capability. And I think as a business owner, this is the big distinction. It goes back to your first question, business skills versus legal skills. As a business owner, you're trying to build capability in your law firm. And what happens is that we want the money first, but what we have to do is build the capacity or capability first. One of the things I loved about co-counseling and still love about co-counseling to this day, it gives me the ability to add on capability and capacity like that with a phone call or an email. And adding on capacity and capability like that means I could charge more and bring more revenue in because I had more resources. It didn't necessarily, that means I had to do it. And that's the most important thing for me is I realized I'm limited intellectually. Like I know I'm not as brilliant as some of my friends are. No, I'm serious. You know, one of the lawyers I co-counseled with all the time is double board certified. Double board certified, I don't know how you do that, but you know, he's a brilliant guy. 
And in his case, I could have him do work and he loves to work. I don't particularly love to work. I, I like to take great care of my clients. I like to spend time with my family. Um, you know, I don't particularly love to work. Um, I love to build things, but I don't particularly love to work. So some people have to work. I don't have to work. I really enjoy life. I enjoy doing things. I enjoy my family, you know. Uh, while we're looking, my view right now is in my office is actually an uh, oceanfront condo. So I have one, two views of the ocean. And so I work really hard at life design. So I really kind of try and live a great life and I don't want to work that much. It doesn't mean I can't make a ton of money um, by building systems and processes that other people get benefit from. And that's really at the end of the day what you're trying to do as a business owner. Trying to take great care of people, build a capacity to do that. If you're thinking like a lawyer, then you're trying to fix the case. As a business owner, you're trying to solve the problem. And so you have to figure out somewhere along the process as a, as a human being, what do you prefer being? The business owner that solves the problem or the lawyer that works the case? And for me, I, I kind of like being the business owner because the lawyer works the case has got a really stressful job and has to remove a lot. I just got to make sure I got the right lawyer working the case. I priced it appropriately and the client's happy. That's a pretty simple job. So that's kind of how I look at it. I think that segues perfectly into my last question because I, many lawyers may be tempted to think if they've got the right credentials, they've got the right um, list of skills, and they've got the right price, that clients will automatically hire them and then be happy with the work. Where does that thinking fall short? Where's the disconnect? Um, yeah. What kind of experience do you need to create for the client ultimately? Fantastic question. Look. As lawyers, we were high achievers and we're high achievers academically, not anywhere else in life, just academically. So we're trained to be really good students. And so we think that certifications are what matter when we get out. And we fall into this trap. I call it the look how smart I am trap of marketing. And you can see this with lawyers on their websites where their websites are amazing on all the things they did, like who they clerked for, um, what certifications they've had, what cases they've worked on. And in this market, in the elder law market, the consumers don't know. I do this joke all the time, Andrea. The consumers don't know. If you say you're a CELA, they think you mean Navy SEAL. They don't know what a CELA is. So you have to kind of shift. Are you in this look how smart I am mindset, which is really coming from anxiety, insecurity, lack of confidence, and it's about you to how can I help you? Which requires you to get out of your head and go to their world. How can you help them? And really for me, um, in my relationship with co the lawyers I coach, the practices I've built, is I always have to get in my head, how can I help them? Because in the whole marketing, the whole process is about them. How can I remove a barrier? today that makes my client experience better versus how can I look smarter? And you really don't have to be, you really have to get this, all right? Now, I mean, whoever's watching, I know you understand this, Andrea. You don't have to be remarkable at being a good um, practitioner, owning a good practice. You just have to be 10% better than your competitors maybe 20% competitor better. And 20% to 30% better makes you the market dominant player. And so as you look at that process, as the clients go through that process, remove everything, every frustration, every problem they have to make it a better experience for them. And over time, every day, if you just fix one thing, make it a little bit better, fix it one thing, make it a little bit better, fix one thing, make it a little better. Over time, if you do that over a year, you're gonna make some incredible improvements in your process, incredible improvements in your marketing. Um, if you study the same amount of time on how to be a better lawyer, no one will know. But they'll know if your phone's answered with somebody with a smile on their voice. They'll know if they got to see you that right day. They'll know if your team remembered their names. They'll know if they were promptly responded to, to phone calls and emails. They'll know if they were treated like they were part of the family. They'll know if they were thanked for the business. They'll know if they were acknowledged They'll know if they were treated with empathy and they were appreciated. They'll never know that you're double board certified. They don't know what that means. So for me, it really goes down to the heart and soul of why are you doing what you're doing? 
are you there to help them? Are you there to be emotionally validated because you're insecure about your own intellectual prowess? And if you're, if you're trying to get more certifications, you're missing the boat. It doesn't help them. And so I would really say that for me, the whole thing's about getting in the trench, getting your hands dirty, having some empathy and understanding what they're going through. And, you know, if you've had a bad experience with an elderly parent, if you've had a bad experience with a loved one um, at a nursing home, you understand what social, being an advocate with your social worker means. And being um, a stressed out parent who's trying to get the kids to school, take care of their parent in a nursing home, take care of their spouse and do the job and being exhausted, um, a promptly returned phone call to solve the problem of the day can make a huge difference versus, hey, you're talking to me who's a double board certified brilliant brainiac um, and I'll call you back in three days when I get a chance. Um, because only I can answer your question. It's really about where your head's at and where your heart's at. And for me, that's one of the things I love about what I get to do. I get to work with passionate lawyers who want to make a difference for people. And that's what I love. I know, I know Cross feels the same way. I know you feel the same way. That's what I love to do. And I just want to unleash really great lawyers and get them out of this academic mindset we learned in law school and just go into the world and make a difference. And it'll be ugly, chaotic, messy. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a heroic journey that really will make a huge difference for people. So anyhow, thanks for letting me spend some time with you today. I hope I didn't talk too much. Oh, no, thank I you. I, what thank an incredible you. message to leave with, because uh, I think there are so many lawyers out there who are looking to make a difference and, and your guidance will help them do it. So thank you again for, you. for sitting My down pleasure. with us today.